Hello, my name is Johnny Crockett and today I'd like to talk to you about fire lighting in Chalcolithic Central and Southern Europe. This is an investigation into Ertzi's fire and whether he deliberately lit fire or whether he carried embers with him. My hypothesis is that Ertzi did not carry embers from one fire to another in birch bark containers, uh, but instead he deliberately lit fires using charcoal when they were required. Ertzi was discovered on the Italian-Austrian border in 1991 at 3,210 metres in altitude. And that's an important fact that I will refer back to later on. Ertzi carried two birch bark containers. Uh, my replications of those are in the picture in the bottom left. Also found with those two containers were 16 Aceplatinoides leaves, which had traces of charcoal found on them. Only one of the containers showed any charcoal residue on the interior wall. Strangely, no lids were found with the containers, but as I'll explain a little bit later, there may be a very good reason for that. It's been proposed that embers were carried inside these uh, these birch bark containers, um, and that the embers were wrapped up in the Ace of Platinoides or Norway maple leaves. The containers are roughly 20 centimetres high and about 15 to 18 centimetres across. Experiments were conducted to determine how the container with charcoal residue was used. I'd like to propose an alternative to carrying hot embers, and that is that cold charcoal was carried instead. A few facts though about Ertzi that we need to consider. He was in his 40s, which means that in charcolithic terms, he was, uh, he was quite an old man. He had severely uh, impeded lung capacity uh, through breathing in too much smoke for all his life. He had Lyme disease, he had arthritis, he had gastric worms, he had evidence of, uh, well, he had many tattoos on, uh, on acupuncture points. So he was not in good health and presumably in a fair degree of pain. He was alone, he was walking uphill at an alpine altitude, don't forget 3,210 meters. And that means that the oxygen level is not quite what it would be at sea level. So there was a lack of oxygen. He'd recently been in a fight. Uh, he had defensive wounds on his hands. Um, he was being hunted, um, as is evidenced by the fact that he was then murdered. Um, and he was five kilometers away from the source of any of his fire lighting equipment. Uh, his last meal, uh, which was cooked, was, uh, was not completely digested, which gives you an idea uh, on timelines as to um, that he moved on from his last camp within a few hours of being killed. Now the aim of my research is to establish what else he carried in his birch bark container through experimentation, replication and comparison with the originals from the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology. I asked myself the following questions. Why carry fire when you have the means to light it? Why use Aceplatinoides leaves as opposed to burdock leaves or dock leaves, uh, which are bigger uh, and presumably would be able to wrap charcoal up uh, even better? I also asked myself the question, how long do individual uh, samples of charcoal burn for? And how far could I carry that uh, that burning ember of charcoal. So transport versus ignition to help determine Ertz's artifacts. If you are traveling at altitude, you're navigating, uh, you're hunting, you're foraging, you're being hunted, you're being tracked down perhaps, uh, it would make your curation of fire extremely difficult because you have to take your bundle of burning ember out of your pot, unwrap it, blow on it, cover it back up, put it back in the pot. Now you may have 10, 15, 20 of these individual bundles. 
that's going to take you a lot of time per hour. Uh, and especially if you refer back to the fact that he may have been hunted, uh, that is just not going to happen. It's evident that he was pyrotechnically proficient. Um, so he could light fires. He had, um, uh, he had Fomos fomentarius, which is the, uh, the false tinder fungus. He had flint, and there's evidence that he had iron pyrites. If you look under a microscope on the tinder fungus, then you could see traces of it. He was found in an area of abundance uh, for tinder, uh, but there was little fuel where he was. Um, so would he have carried that fuel with him? Uh, that's unlikely because it's bulky uh, and long sticks sort of get in the way. Uh, it's, it's unlikely that he would have carried fuel with him, if only for the weight. Ertzi's speed, uh, using Naismith's rules, was about three kilometres an hour, especially at that altitude, and he was ascending, and he was injured, and he was carrying weight. And each ember would need curating time and time again. This is, this is going to take up many minutes per hour, making his progress extremely slow. I did a couple of experiments before I got on to looking at how he carried fire. First of all, I had a look at, uh, at the leaves, the Acer platinoides leaves. I chose three leaves and they were selected for their size. The bigger, the better. Uh, I wanted to get um, as big as I possibly could find. Um, and I, I did this in July, which is estimated how, uh, what part of the year he was found. Uh, sorry, what part of the year he was, he was killed. Um, leaves one and two had petioles, which are the stalks, um, and they, they were removed to prevent hydraulic conductivity. Hydraulic conductivity is how you draw moisture out of the body of the leaf down the stalk. Um, and that has, uh, by removing the petiole, it has the, uh, the effect of keeping all the moisture within the body of the leaf. Leaf three, though, had the petiole um, left in place. They were measured on a, on a grid photographic scale and each day I picked them up and I bent them uh, just to see how brittle or how malleable they were uh, and I recorded them on a scale of one to ten. Uh, by day four the leaf of the petiole was non-viable. After one week the leaves with no petioles were still viable. Uh, this experiment took place in July 2019. Uh, the Aceplatinoides leaves um, they have a latex sap, which prevents early onset senescence. Uh, it, it stops them from decaying too quickly. The removal of the petioles, as I say, reduces the hydraulic conductivity. Uh, and what, whereas the leaves are not the biggest, I've already mentioned dock and burdock, which would have been available to him, it's the latex in the leaf that makes them waterproof. And that is perhaps why there is no lid to the pots, because you could just put these leaves over the top. The data in the table on this slide uh, provides leaf size and viability as charcoal wrapping. Uh, and you've also there got Ertzi's largest leaf and the smallest leaf. And you can see that the leaves that I chose are slightly bigger. So this is an example of a leaf. Uh, and this photograph uh, was taken in January 2021 from a leaf which was used in July 2019. So that's about 18 months old. Charcoal experiment. I made some charcoal samples using a scalpel of one, two, three, four, and five centimeter cubed. And these sizes um, were only approximate due to crumbling. And I hasten to add at this point that the density was not homogeneous throughout. The samples were wrapped in cling film and then put in water so that I could measure the volume and then hence the density. After I unwrapped them, I then uh, took the moisture reading using a hygrometer and then I put them in a fire, a charcoal fire, uh, until uh, and my criteria here was that the entire uh, surface was glowing. Then they were removed and the temperature was taken every 60 seconds until the fire, uh, until the, the temperature of the charcoal was under 50 degrees. And the experiment took place 18 months ago. Ertzi is likely, now this is important, uh, Ertzi is like likely to have been walking at 500 meters in every 10 minutes using Nate Smith's rule. The table on the left there shows the, um, the sample measurements. 
But on the right, on the graph, you can see that the sample that lasted the longest was sample number five, which is the five centimeter cubed uh, piece of charcoal. So the experiment to determine what Ertzi carried in his containers. So which combination of charcoal leaves, and I also tried using insulating ash, uh, did Ertzi carry in his containers? The combinations uh, are on the following slide, uh, and I will explain those in a second. Ash was used just experimentally to see if it could regulate the oxygen supply and thereby extend the life of the embers. Each birch bark container, each of the eight of them, were then carried for one kilometre. The, the distance was recorded, but the time was irrelevant. The internal walls were then photographed using a microscope at Exeter University. The experiment took place in July 2019. So we have the eight samples here. We had embers for the first six and charcoal for the last two. And you can see that they're placed either directly in, in the uh, containers or they're wrapped up in leaves or they're wrapped up in leaves and ash. They've got ash um, placed on top of them as well. Um, so you have the combinations there. And the results of the photographs look like this. And I immediately discounted any of them that looked black because that didn't look like what was in the, uh, in the South Royal Museum of Archaeology's original. And the sample which looked most like the original was sample number eight. So that's non-burning charcoal placed in a, in a container and the container was lined with leaves. And I've, I personally believe and I have yet to compare it under a microscope with the original, uh, but with the, as the military say, the Mark I eyeball, this is the most similar. So this is what the, uh, the birch bark container looks like, and still does to this day. This photograph was taken uh, uh, just a, a couple of days ago. And you can still see on the container wall, there are traces of charcoal deposits. In conclusion, then, these results support the theory that Ertzi did not transport and curate fire, but instead lit fire as and when it was required. The leaves were used as a waterproof, a, a dry bag to all intents and purposes, um, to keep the, the charcoal dry. Uh, as coal charcoal was carried, there was no requirement for ash to act as an insulator, which is why it's not found on the original. Um, and it is, as I say, it is intended that I will, uh, after COVID has been and gone, go back to the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology and compare the original using a microscope. This is the bibliography um, that I used for, for my research, or a part of it. If anybody has any questions, then please feel free to get in touch. And so that leaves me with just a, a big thank you to, uh, to everybody for uh, for listening and for watching, and especially to Exarc for facilitating this. So thank you very much, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.